Hello, book club. I am delighted to be joining you today. Uh, my name is Leah. I am the Arnhold Fellow this year, which I'll tell you a little bit more about at the end of my video. And I am going to talk today about the short story, No Woman Born from 1944 by C.L. Moore. This is a horror story appropriately for Halloween, but only from certain characters' perspectives. So I would be very interested to hear at the end about whether this really qualifies as a horror story in your reading and what it means for the genre if it does. So C.L. Moore is definitely gender ambiguous sounding on purpose. In 1944, there were not a lot of women publishing in science fiction and um, the whole genre really was still finding itself consolidating. Uh, the pulp magazines that they were publishing in, literally they were named for how cheap they were, right? The pulp paper doesn't hold up very well. It's like really thin and cheap. So it's a good sign of the way that the genre was thought of at the time when this when this book came out in in magazine form initially. Um, it was really an underground sort of genre still. Despite that, I would argue that the feminism that we see in this text is it has more in common with the feminism that we see today in contemporary society than the mainstream movements that were actually popular in 1944. So in an important way, C.L. Moore is ahead of her time. This story is told from the perspective of John Harris. He is traveling to see something that he's very apprehensive about. His very dear friend Deirdre, who's like a Hollywood starlet, she's extremely famous, she has this huge following. She was recently in a terrible fire and her body is basically destroyed. Her fans are already mourning her. John has gotten word, however, that Deirdre's mind has been transplanted into a robotic body. And there she is. So when he gets there to see her, he immediately, instantly recognizes her. That's Deirdre, just the way that she moves, the way she talks, even though it's a robot and it has no, it, the face is totally ambiguous. Uh, he can tell that it's her inside. And she convinces him not only of her identity as Deirdre, but also her humanity. She actually focuses most of her attention on performing these mundane human activities instead of doing robot things that you might expect her to be doing. So for example, she, um, she, she smokes a cigarette, even though she doesn't have lungs or lips or like it's a performance of smoking a cigarette. And um, she puts on a whole theater performance for her fans and astonishes them. Um, she is essentially playing the role of the human Deirdre that she used to be. But John starts getting very nervous. He and the scientist who made her robotic body, uh, these two men are talking together all the time, very nervously about how frail she is from their perspective. She's, they say, you're only a clear glowing mind animating a metal body like a candle flame in a glass and as precariously vulnerable to the wind. So they, see her pseudo human situation as being probably unsustainable and like easily thrown off because it's only held together by this thin, this thin candle flame in a glass, like temporary, very vulnerable uh, flame that is still somehow animating this robot body. They also get very disturbed by the fact that they can't read her anymore. I mean, literally her face is blank now, right? So here's another quote. He even wondered whether if her mind was as delicately poised as Maltzer the scientist feared, one would either, even know whether or not it had slipped. There was so little evidence one way or the other in the unchanging outward form of her. So 
this is very disturbing to him. He can't read her. He can't figure out what's going on inside. He, they also say that she is not female anymore. She hasn't any sex, they say, because um, she's got a robotic body now. So like the performances of femininity that she continues pulling off pretty effectively are disconnected from the biological female body that they expect to be attached to those performances. Without those things going together, they, they don't know how to interpret it. They find it disturbing and kind of grotesque. They say she can't compete. And they also expect that all of her fans are going to turn on her really um, abruptly, which we don't actually see happen. So after some time passes, Deirdre seems to be becoming withdrawn. And it also seems like she is changing further as she spends more time in the robot body. Quote, Providing, of course, that the mind inside the metal did not veer from its inherited humanity as the years went by. A dweller in a house may impress his personality upon the walls, but subtly the walls too may impress their own shape upon the ego of the man. Neither of them thought of that at the time. Okay, so basically we have these characters, the dear friend from her human life and the scientist who made her robotic body talking with each other about how living in a robot body would change a human mind. They seem to accept that it goes the other way, that the mind is able to change or manipulate the body. I mean, there's very clear evidence for that because Deirdre's mind is able to manipulate her robotic body in a way that they see as recognizably her, human, Deirdre. But it goes the other way too, is what they're saying. And this is scary to them. How is a change this drastic in her body gonna change her subjectivity? And just to apply this to our lives a little bit more directly, since we, we are not all running around in robot bodies yet, um, how does any change in technology affect our subjective space, right? I mean, we are all living through Zoom and I'm recording this on a, on a computer. I imagine that that changes the experience of this interaction in pretty significant ways, good and bad ways, right? It's just different, a different set of data that we have to work with. So what's that gonna do to Deirdre? How is that going to affect her identity? The answer from the perspective of this story has a lot to do with um, like an exchange. It's, it's not that she's getting better or worse. It's that she has different possibilities available to her now. So for example, she cannot dance, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce this, sur le point, right? Sorry to the ballerinas. She can't really like pull off that type of dancing anymore because of her robotic body, but New things will more than balance the loss I've been practicing. Do you know I can turn a hundred foetets? I, I, I don't know dancing words, but she she's able to spin, spin, spin a <laughs> hundred times without a flaw. It's incredible. And quote, it was humanity that seemed by contrast jointed and mechanical now. So in fact, her new dancing makes us look at human dancing from a different perspective. It makes us see that there are frontiers that it hasn't crossed yet. So essentially, we have a, a, a world that C.L. Moore has created where humanity is a performance. It's a role that you do or do not play. And we think that Deirdre may very well be leaving that role behind, looking for some a different performance. That brings us to the climax. The scientist has hit a breaking point. In the final moment in a bid for control, I think, he threatens to throw himself out of the window because he just doesn't know what to do anymore. It's the only thing he thinks he can do to kind of make his point. 
And there is this really tense standstill. Everybody's standing in the room. He's kind of halfway out of the window. And suddenly Deirdre displays this superhuman strength and speed that we have never seen any sign of before. She's been keeping that locked up. And she rescues her creator, whoosh. She asks, do you still think of me as delicate? I could tear my way through these walls, I think. I've found no limit yet. So Deirdre is, she turns the tables in this moment dramatically, right? Uh, we only know about her, what John's perspective reveals, but we can certainly ask where the horror in this narration comes from. Is it actually because of the inhuman changes she's going through or is it his fear, his desire to keep her the same makes her transformation look like a horror story? This question is never resolved, um, which is part of why I think it's okay for me to tell you the end of the story and you still have to go read it yourselves because it, it's the tone is ambiguous. I think that is a lot of the drama of the story. And by the way, this is a short story. I think it's like 35 pages that is definitely available online, accessible to all of you. When she tells John that she is leaving, quote, the distant taint of metal is already in her voice. She is shifting in a direction that is really hard for her to communicate to him. So does this really qualify as a horror story? By what standard does it qualify? With what effect on how we define horror stories and you know, the experience of horror in our culture? What is that actually telling us? This is the kind of stuff that I'm trying to answer. Uh, I, I discovered this story as a part of my big writing project. And that brings me back to the Arnhold program because what this program is, is basically an opportunity for you guys to do a big writing project and try to answer a question that comes to you like this kind of question. So basically we are looking for juniors and seniors who are um, English majors that want some extra community in the English department, that want the chance to ask these kinds of questions and really work with people to figure out the answers, which is the only way I know how to figure out the answers. And um, essentially, we are going to structure for you the process of getting from the question to an actual product that you could use for an application for something that you could use for uh, you know, furthering your academic career or that you can use to pursue intellectual curiosity in a way that is gonna bring you into connection with other people who are interested in the same stuff. This is the vision. The application is due mid-November. Uh, please email me just to say you're interested or with any questions. I'm Leah Norris. This has been a pleasure. Have a lovely, lovely afternoon.